that's going on in the world. So much happening in the individual lives that Lord, the only one we can look to right now is God. And so Lord, I pray that the spirit of the living God would minister to each one of us. Allow your word to come alive and minister to us. The word says it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And so Holy Spirit, we depend upon you in this moment, in this season. We give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. And all of God's people and as well and around the world said amen and amen. Give the Lord a shout out for everyone. Give God praise. I'm reading from Psalm 78. A psalm that you may have read a few times. But today we're going to unpack it. My message today is entitled, When God Says, Trust Me. When God Says, Trust Me. From Psalm 78, we're going to read verses 9 through 22. And... In a moment, I'm going to refer also to verses 40 and 42. This is the word of the Lord, Psalm 78 and verse 9. The children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turn back. In the day of battle. Is that in your Bible? They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. And what? Forgot his works. And his wonders that he had shown them. Oh my God. Marvelous things he did in the sight of their father in the land of Egypt, in the field of Zion. He divided the sea and caused them to pass through. And he what made the water stand up like a heap. In the daytime, also, he led them with the cloud, and all the night with the light of fire. He split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. He also brought what? Streams out of He brought what? Rain. Not just a trickle of oh. water. Oh. He brought streams oh. out of the rock oh. and caused waters to run down like rivers. But they sinned even more against him by rebelling against the Most High in the wilderness. And they, notice this, tested God in their heart by asking for the food of their fancy. Yes, they spoke against God and said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? Behold, he struck the rock so that the waters, what, gushed out, and the streams overflowed. Can he give bread also? Can he provide meat for his people? Therefore, the Lord heard this and was furious. So a fire 
Israel was kindled against Jacob. And anger also came up against Israel because they did not what? Believe in God and did not what? Trust in his salvation. We thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Let the church say amen. amen. You may be seated. They did not believe in God mm. and did not trust mm. in salvation. Come on, come on. When we look to Psalm 78, I want you to get this. It is the second longest psalm in the Bible. Yes, the first psalm is Psalm 119. Yes. The longest psalm in Scripture is Psalm 119. Mm -hmm. But today's message comes from the second longest psalm, and that is Psalm 78. My message is entitled When God Says Trust Me. All right. All right. Yeah. When God says Trust Me, the word Trust. Uh -huh. Curtis. In the King James Version of the Bible is used 191 times. The word trust or some form of the word trust is used 191 times in the King James Version. You need to understand that if any word is used that many times, God is trying to get our attention. What I need you to understand, however, and this is not in my notes, no. When you say you trust God, there is something you have to untrust. All right. Oh, yeah. 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 In, in order to trust God, you have to untrust you. All right. All right. I'm a preacher to the left side of the church. Whenever you say you trust God, you have to untrust your money. Because we've learned to trust our money. I'm going somewhere with this. Whatever you say, you trust God. You have to untrust people. Trusting automatically means untrusting. So 191 times or more, a version of the word trust is used in the Bible. Psalm 78. Whenever I look at this psalm, Archie, here's my Introduction. I'm going to unpack it in a paragraph. Throughout the Old Testament, God, Marion, takes the time to remind his people how consistent, that's an important word, how powerful and how faithful he has been to them. I'm going to praise him today. What God wants to do now is raise up a new generation of people who will trust him 
trust him. And he rebukes us when we don't. I've added a subtitle ball to my sermon today. The greatest insult. Not to trust God is the greatest insult. If I surveyed the congregation, mm -hmm. stay with me, you will find out that God in a remarkable way has done something for you uh -huh. that you didn't deserve. Yes, come on. Yes. Yes. Come on here. How powerful 
and how faithful he has been to them. But I want you to get from this. Kill him. Is that throughout the Bible, Kiosha, there is a theology of remembering. Remembering. Whenever you have bad days, what you need to do is remember those good days. Amen. Throughout your life, you can't fall for the trick of the devil. Watch this. Where he has the tendency of magnifying how bad it is in your life. Do I have a witness here? Satan is a master of magnifying all of the bad stuff. Because if he could get you to focus on the bad stuff, he will rob God of the glory that God deserves to get. Somebody help me praise him. The bad stuff is setting you up for the good stuff that God always wanted to do. I'm going there. Watch this. Psalm 78. Psalm 78. My message today is entitled when God says, trust me. I have to tell you, Tim, that when people say that, you think twice about it. When somebody say to me, Bishop, trust me. You know what I say out of my mind? I only trust God. Amen. This message is about reinforcing to become the reality that we have no other choice if we are going to survive if we don't trust God. My message is when God says, trust me. For me not to trust God, what I'm saying in this message, Randy, is that if I don't trust God, it is the greatest insult I could give to anyone. Because God's been too good to you. God, God's been too good to you. Even when things are bad, God is still good to you. I conclude you. Now, go, 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 watch, watch this, and I'm going to share my quote of the day, but I, I want you to hear this. When God does not change a bad situation, it's for you to learn how to trust him until he does. Somebody let me praise him. I think you got it, you know. If, if God does not change a bad situation, it is for the purpose of you trusting him until he does. And you say, well, Bishop, what if it never changed? Hear me, I'm glad you asked. What, what if it never changed, Bishop? And there are some never-changing situations for real, for real in life. When things never change, Miriam, it's because he's changing you no matter what. Give God praise, give God praise. There are things that may never change in your life. There are things that may never change. But I bet you change. There's some, when, when God may doesn't change things, he's changing you. So I know what you going to do. What are you going to do when God don't change a bad thing? 
throughout Psalm 78, and we're going to look at it. There's some interesting verses here I'm going to point out, but I, I want you to hear this. God takes time in the second longest psalm in the Bible, watch this Beverly, to remind his people what he did. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Now, the truth is that when you love someone, you shouldn't have to remind them. Because what you experience in the love you've received, that's a reminder by itself. Amen. Everybody's not with you. Amen. But he uses Job to pray an entire psalm to remind them of how good he's been. When the devil fits your mouth, to say something negative about what's going on in your life, it is an assault against God. It is not only an assault, but it's an insult because that's what the devil really want to do. He want to insult God. He want to make God look so bad that he makes you look at only negative things. But the last time I checked, he woke me up this morning. The last time he provided everything I needed when I didn't know where it was coming from. Do I have a witness in here? There's always God, something we can complain about, and if you fall for that, the devil gets the glory instead of God, and that is an insult to God. He uses Latricia. All of Psalm 78 to remind Israel of how good he's been to them. So here is my quote. When we understand that God says, trust me, we need to learn something about what that really means in our experience with God. And before I close today, I'm going to give you three reasons why we need to trust God now. Not later. Mm -hmm. Now, not tomorrow. Now, not next year, but now. Here is my quote. I believe that you would agree with me. God's way is better than your way. His plan is bigger than your plan. I'm going to preach this. His dream for your life is more rewarding, more fulfilling, better than you've ever dreamed of. Now stay open and let God do it. His way. I want you to share that with someone who's trying to do it their way. Amen. Amen. Leave it there for a moment. Read it with me. God's way is better than your way. His plan is bigger than your plan. His dream for your life is more rewarding, more fulfilling, better than you've ever dreamed of. Now stay open and let God do it his way. I'm going to ask that we embrace that. Let me tell you why. What should be a dream, Carlette, for a lot of people is now a nightmare. which should be a good thing, is now a bad thing. So what do you do when your life is more bad than good? What do you do when every dream you 
you had is turning into a nightmare. What, what do you do when your plans for a fulfilling and wonderful future becomes now a test of your sanity? Because if you don't grab your head now, you're going to lose your mind. I'm going to preach this over here. And let me tell you the truth. That's exactly what the devil wants. Satan wants to embarrass God, insult God. He wants to make you look like a straight damn fool. He wants you to think that everything you've done that's good is actually a curse. And now you're having to convince yourself that the God we serve is not a man that he should lie. God is going to do everything that he promised. Amen. Give God praise. Give God praise. So look at what he says. We're looking at Psalm 78. My subtitle today is, you have to know this. It's the greatest insult. The greatest insult in your life is that you don't give God the glory in a bad situation. God will allow bad things to happen, could I keep it real, to test you. It's a test. Because you told somebody you trust God. Come on. Yes, Lord. You told a whole lot of people you trust God. A lot of people, watch this, this is going to hurt, but there's a lot of people who are living on your faith in God. There's a lot of people who Charmaine, on your faith in God based on what you said about God and they're waiting for their turn to see it in their lives. But you saw it and you glorified God and you told people what God has done in your life. Now you're being tested. My God. Trust, write it down, requires Yes. Trust requires tests. God will always test your trust. Because he wants to do so much more, D, that he got to trust you where you are now to get you where he wants you to be. I'm going to preach to some people who understand. So let's wrap this up. Here is something I want you to see in verse 9. Three reasons why we need to trust God now. Look at verses 9 through 11. Read with me. The children of Ephraim being armed, look at this, Marvin, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. Stop right there. They were already armed. God had already promised the victory. Paul, they're already armed. The, the, the name Ephraim is another name representing the children of Israel. The name Jacob is used, Israel is used, Ephraim is used only to talk about the same nation. Let me tell you, if there's anything that the pandemic has taught the world, is that if you trust God, you'll trust him in a pandemic. Come on. 
it says the children of Israel being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. Is that in your Bible? How are you going to turn back in the day of battle when God has already, Albert, equipped you with the weapon you need to overcome the battle? Somebody say amen. In other words, look at it, Carlette. In this verse, it says they're armed, ready for the battle. They're carrying bowls, but they turn back in the day of battle. How do you give up on a God who's been so good to you? How do you quit praying and worshiping God when you know that there's a lot of bad stuff that happened, but there's a lot of good stuff that happened too, and I'm not going to let the devil get the glory because I might have a bad day, a bad week, or a bad year. God is still good. Say with me, God says, trust me. God says, trust me. So I'm going to give you the weapons you need. But in the day of battle, don't run. In the day of battle, don't back up. Everybody will face things in life that will make you want to run. Is there anybody sitting up in here right now that say, Mitchell, I just want to run. I, I, I just feel like running. I, if I could just, uh, if, if, if I could magically disappear, Bishop, I would just do it right now because I hate what I see and I don't like what I'm going through. But you don't have to answer the call. Because he gave you the weapon, but you're turning back in the battle. How are you going to do that? How are you going to explain to the next generation how many of you have grandchildren? I see a few hands. How many of you have children you're still raising? I see more hands. I want you to know that your faith affects your offspring. Your lack of faith affects your offspring too. When your children and grandchildren, watch this Mary, see you praising God when they already know this issues, they're going to learn how to praise Him too. Don't want to hear what I'm saying. When the children can see that you're going to serve God in spite of the issues, they lock it in their memory and say, Mama did it. Daddy did it. And I'm going to do it too. But the greatest test is what you do when you have your weapon. And you're running from the battle. There comes a time, stay with me, in all of our lives when you don't run no more. Oh, I'm talking about. You don't run no more. There are things that you will face and you want to run. Because you got enough. Come on. Come on. But there comes a point in time in your spiritual experience where you say to God, you've been too good to me, and God, you armed me for this battle, and right now I'm going to stand up and let the devil know I'm not running. Running is not in my resume. Praising God is what you have to do. And when your mind says quit, rebuke yourself and say that devil is a liar. Keep going. 
my friends up in here, say it with me. God says, trust me. Trust me. That's not a lot to ask. But if God says, trust me, he will never ask you to trust him without giving you weapons to fight. In verse 9, it says, the children of Israel, being armed and carrying bows, turned back in the day of battle. What an insult. Mm. Quitting is an insult. Amen. Stop wow. fighting is an insult. Amen. Look at what it says in the next couple of verses, and I'll go to my second point. They did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. You know what a covenant is? They did not keep the covenant of God. Shawana, a covenant is between two entities. The two entities come in agreement. And God says, I never broke my covenant. It says here, Mike, it says they did not keep the covenant of God. They refused to walk in his law. But I'm telling you, watch this. At some point, you got to make a decision. You've heard me preach this before. Making a decision is important in your life for many reasons. But Cheryl, what a lot of people do is they decide not to decide. Amen. In other words, Archie, I'm not going to make a decision. That is a decision. <laughs> So not to decide is a decision. So when you need people to make a decision and they don't, they just made a decision. God made a decision. Hear me. When he chose Israel, Linda, he said, I am going to keep my covenant no matter what you do. You see, the covenant with God is a covenant that cannot be broken by God. And God says, I'm going to be with you, come hell or high water. I'm going to be with you in the valley. I'll be with you in the fire. I'll be with you whenever you go through, whatever you go through. But my question is, what are you going to do? So a lot of people say with me, Actually benefiting on the consistency of God's covenant. Oh, come on now. They are benefiting from a God that says, I am the Lord yeah. and I change not. Yeah. I don't flip on my people. Yeah. I don't give up on my people. Even when they fail to say, that God don't give up on his people. But people give up on people. Thank you, Jesus. Come on. And people give up on God. There are churches full of people. Mm -hmm. SOL included. Oh, come on, Bishop. Who have people mm -hmm. Say it. in those churches who are sitting in church, wow. but they gave up on God. Oh, wow. They don't want you to think they did. So they want you to look at them as though they haven't given up on God. But everybody that come to church is not trusting God. Come on, I'm going to throw this mic. Everybody that confess God 
does not always live for God. So the Lord says in this season, hear me, I, I, I can't emphasize it enough. I can't emphasize it enough. Where, where we are in human history right now, what we've been through, a pandemic that's manifested a hundred years after the last one. And now my, my dad was born during the first one, the Chinese flu, and a and hundred years later, you know, here we are going through another crisis that's global. I want you to know that the Lord says, I am God and I change not. I've made up my mind that I'm going to trust God and I'm going to trust God because God trusted me. I'm going to trust God, Chris, because God is in covenant with me and that covenant is never broken because God don't break covenants. People break covenants. God in this season kills you. He don't want you to be like other women. Come on, Lord. He don't want you looking at other women. Yes, Lord. Come on. He's not trying to get you to be some other woman. All right. Come on. Jessica, God wants you to be you. And the faith that he gives you is adequate like it is for any other woman. Thank you, Jesus. People get it twisted. Thank you, Jesus. Hear me. Come on. Here is what people do. They say that sister got it going on. They say that sister is just on it. Somebody told me that recently. <laughs> I'm all in your Kool-Aid. I want you to know that there are people that will tell you that sister got it going on. And they will tell you, you ought to be like that sister. But God didn't tell you to be like that sister. Can I put you here? But I want you to understand that there's a whole lot of sisters and brothers who got it going on. But you don't know the hell they went through to get to where they are today. Can I preach up in the air? Give all praise. And in other words, I want you to understand, don't look at a sister now because you don't know the hell she's been through yesterday. When you see her praising God and she's strutting her stuff and she's looking like success, looking for a place to happen now. You don't know the hell she been through, the pain she had to endure, and the tears she had to cry. And you're trying to be like her. You know what you're saying? I want your trouble that got you where you are. When you think somebody succeeded, you just want what they want to go ahead and dance. So God praise up in here. What I need you to understand is that God does. 
doesn't always tell you God prays him in here. He doesn't always tell you what journey he's going to take you through to get you where he wants you to be. God prays him in here. What you've got to tell God is what you've told him all your life. No matter what I have to go through, Lord, I'll be satisfied. We're going to read verses 40 and 42. 40 through 42. But let, let me say this. I don't know who this is for. But I want to say prophetically right now. There's too much of you in yourself. There's too much of you in your stuff. Come on. And as long as there's so much of you in your stuff, yeah. you delay and postpone God yeah. being able to do what he want to do because he's going to let you do your stuff. <laughs> there's too much of you in your stuff. So when you say to God, you can have my stuff. Yeah. All of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You can have all my stuff. I'm going to trust you with it. And I'll trust you without it. You can have all my stuff. And then God says, if you could give me all your stuff, I'm going to show you what you never had. I'm going to show you what you never had. Give me your stuff and I'll show you what you never had. There's too much of you in your stuff. So watch this. 
Number two, the reason why God says trust me is because I want you to take the limits off of me. Look at verses 40 to 42. Read it all out. How are you? They provoke him, capital H, meaning God. They provoke him in the wilderness. And what grieved him in the desert? Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited. The Holy One did. They did not remember His power. The day when He what? Redeemed them from Balaam. God says, I already delivered you. All right, so, so, so notice this. Look at verse 4. They provoked me in the wilderness. They grieved me in the desert. And then verse 41. Is this in your Bible? Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. In other words, watch this. God is saying, I've done too much for you. Have you lost your mind? I, I, I've done too much for you. Now, in the wilderness, you provoked me. You, I, but you know what happened in the wilderness? I fed you when you had no food. Yes, yes. I gave you manna from heaven. Yes. I, 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 I provided your provision. And you're not going to serve me? Come on. Mm. He says this, look, look at what he says. He, he says, how often they provoked me. And verse 41, look at what it says. An echo again and again, again and again, again and again. Is that in your Bible? And yes, again and again, they what? Tested God and limited the Holy One of Israel. There's another vision in the IRG that's on on the international television program. You can watch it on Saturday night, eight o'clock our time. It's on the Now Network. And we're doing a series in, in Psalm 78. And in this passage, it's amazing that God says, you can limit me by your lack of faith. Amen. You can limit God. And one of the comments I made, Curtis, on television was that it's improbable to think that we can limit a limitless God. Come on. Come on. But God says, you limit me when you stop trusting me. Mm. You limit me when I'm with you in the wilderness and you don't praise me. I'm with you in the worst time of your life and you don't glorify me. You see, Kim, it's that I see in faith. And I want you to get this. If you don't see faith, you're going to see failure. If faith is not primary in your life, failure is going to become the order of the day. Faith or failure. You either live in faith or you end up accepting a life of faith. That's good. Life is too short. All right. To keep living in faith. God's been too good to you. Amen. They grieved me, he said. They tempted me. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Verse 42, they did not remember his power. Have you forgotten? Have you lost your mind? 
That you know God says, I'm all powerful. Come on. There's nothing too hard for me. Come on. So, it's not God, it's me. Mm -hmm. It's not God, it's you. Come on. Take the limit off of God. Mm. My last point is found in Psalm 78, going back to verses 20 to 22, and then verses 58. I want you to see this. Point number three. Three reasons why we need to trust God now. Number one, you need to trust God now because your battles today brings your blessings tomorrow. Number two, we trust God, Beverly, to take the limit off of God. God wants us to see his power and his potential. Finally, number three is, we need to trust God now. Because when we show a lack of faith, after we have seen miracles, it's the greatest insult to God. God says, why are you going to insult me like that? That you could see what I've already done. You could see that when you wasn't supposed to be where you are, I got you there. When you wasn't supposed to have anything, I provided for you. When you wasn't supposed to live, I gave you life. God says, what is wrong with you? The greatest insult is my subtitle. The greatest insult is when we show a lack of faith after we've seen miracles. The greatest insult is that when God forgave you, you got the nerve to say, I'm not going to forgive anybody else. That's the insult. When you would say, God, I know where you brought me from. I know where I've been and I know where you brought me from and God, when I think about it, it makes me shudder. When I think about your grace and mercy, when I think about all that you've done for me that you didn't have to do and I didn't even deserve, God, I will never open my mouth and complain again. But Lord, I'm going to turn my complaints into praises. And I'm going to praise you. And you Lord, you that do. Look at what he says in verse 22. It says in verse 22, because they did not believe in God and they did not trust in his salvation. salvation. Do you see that? Yes. That's an insult. They did not believe in God and they did not trust in his salvation. Verse 58 says this, 58 and 59, for they provoked him to anger and their in their, with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their hard images. When God heard that, he was furious. Wow. wow. And greatly abhorred Israel. Look at that. Mm. That is verse 59. When God heard this, he was furious. And greatly abhorred Israel. The Lord is saying, that's an insult to me. And the Lord is saying, I've been too good to you that you would insult me like that. Come on. Oh my God. Yeah. It's like God is saying, what more 
do I need to do in your life? How many more blessings do I need to bring? I know bad things may have happened, but I was with you in the bad. I'm with you in the good. And the Lord is saying right now, I just don't want you to stop trusting me. Because when you stop trusting me, you stop me from being able to bless you. Wow. Wow. You post all the blessings of God. Because now you say, well, Bishop, how can I do that? It's improbable to think that I have limited God. But the Lord says, you limit me with a lack of faith. And he says, what I want to do, I can't, because I do everything by faith. And so now i got to pause. i got to pause and get back to work on you so you can have faith again. And when you have faith again, I bless again. But if you're not in faith, then you cause my blessings to be postponed. My message today is entitled, God Says Trust Me. God Says Trust Me. The greatest insult to God is that you could look him in the face and not praise him. Because you're having a bad day. You can look at how good God's been to you. But because you're in a bad season right now, you won't give him the glory. Who are you? And the Lord says, okay, so I'm going to show you. I'm going to let you do it. Have you ever seen what happened? When God let people do what people want to do, they usually come back running and say, God, I realize now that everything I thought I was big and bad enough to do, I still need you. I need you more. I need you now. My message is entitled, God says, trust me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Let's worship David. Help me, John. Father, I want to thank you now. That, Lord, I understand without a doubt that, Lord, what you was doing the whole time was teaching me to trust you. And Lord, I owe you an apology. I owe you an apology. Because I insulted you with a lack of faith. I owe you an apology, God. Because when you bless me so much, how is it that I cannot? Continue to worship. And so say it with me now, Lord Jesus. I confess. I repent. Because Lord, I know you've been good to me. When I shouldn't even deserve it, you've been good to me. And so Lord, forgive me. I insulted you.
until I come. After the same manner also, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this cup, you remember me until I return. Lord, I ask that you pray as we pray. That Lord, you would bless these elements that remind us how good you've been. Yeah.
He took the cup and he said, This is the new covenant in my blood. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Take the cup, brothers and sisters, and drink all of it. The body and blood of our Lord. Yeah, yeah. Would you take the cup and pass it to the end of the and the ushers will attend you. You may be seated. Thank you, Chris. Let the church say that.